Before we begin this Microsoft Digital event, we would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we live and work throughout Australia, as well as the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people viewing this event today. We pay our respects to Elders both past, present and emerging, and recognise and celebrate their continuing connection to land, waters and community. Our reverence also extends to all First Nation and Indigenous peoples, as well as their ancestral lands. Hi everybody and welcome to another great episode of New Breakpoint. My name's Simon Waite and today we've got an excellent topic for you, uh, particularly if you're looking about how you can build your next gen applications and benefit from not only the scalability and performance capability you can get out of the cloud, but also how to do it in a cost effective manner. Before we get to that though, just a, a quick couple of reminders. Uh, if you do want to share today's content with your colleagues or your community, keep an eye on your inbox. We'll send you an email in the next couple of days that will give you a link uh, for where you can download the videos. And this is an interactive session. Um, myself and uh, my guest for today will be here answering questions throughout the session. So if you do have any top of mind questions, make sure to use the Q&A window uh, in Teams to uh, put those questions in and we'll get to them. If it's a, a sort of a gnarly question or an interesting question that requires a bit more discussion, uh, we'll keep those through until the end uh, where we'll have a live Q&A session. So please do stick around for that. Uh, but without further ado, let me introduce uh, our guest for today. Today, I'm going to be joined by uh, Shane Bodicino. He's our uh, Chief Architect for Azure here in Australia. A really super interesting role um, and one where he brings a lot of knowledge uh, from his experience in the industry too. And he's going to have a great topic for us today um, and one that maybe we should spend a bit more time talking about. Okay, so now I'm joined by my guest for today, Shane. How are you doing, Shane? Good to see you. Yeah, fantastic, Simon. Thanks for having me today on New Breakpoint. Uh, do you want to talk to us just a little bit about, you know, the topic you're going to cover today, um, and then we'll get we'll get straight into it. Well, maybe you've stolen my thunder, but we're going to talk about cost optimization. Now, we're not going to be talking about reserved instances or those basic, you know, things like that. So you see the title here. We're talking about cost optimizing your architecture on Azure. So my target audience today is those who are, you know, tuning into New Breakpoint. We're talking about the builders, the developers, the architects, those who are, you know, constructing the Lego blocks that is our platform. And I guess my question to everyone here today is, you know, are you a Lego master? Are you a Lego master? Okay, well, I know I'm a Lego master, maybe not in the same context that you're talking about here. So um, I'm going to go grab a seat in the audience. Uh, I'll be back a little bit later for Q&A uh, with Shane. But in the meantime, Shane, over to you. I'm really looking forward to this session. So are you a Lego master? Now, just like a car has an economy value, that could be like having low liters per 100 kilometers. Um, actually, in this new world, it is MPG hyphen E for electric vehicles. But often that, you know, low uh, economy value can often mean low performance. Now, maybe a better analogy for today's session would be, you know, stickers on an appliance for an efficiency rating. How can we increase the efficiency of your architecture without compromising other facets such as reliability, performance, operational overhead, you know, and so on. So that is the crux of what today's session is about. So I hope you're all excited here. We're going to dive right into this. And this, I'm going to say, is a rather somewhat advanced cost optimized session. I'm not going to explain, you know, what the different Azure services are. So some homework for you. Uh, if I mention a topic that you're not familiar with, that said, you know, we do have the chat here. So drop a message in the chat. We're going to cover a lot in a hurry, many different domains. And the objective today is to give you a thing or two that you can take away. Actually, you know, if you walk out of this session with one or two meaningful cost saving ideas, you can execute in your environment. I'll be personally happy. More so, you know, if you can drive cost out of your environment even better. Yes, we want you to spend less. 
So I'm hoping you will too, and that's the intent for today. So we're going to cover three main domains. We're going to cover operational optimization, the infrastructure optimization, and lastly, architectural optimization. So look, when we look through the lens of public cloud, you know, it's brought us a new dimension of flexibility. Um, again, back to the Lego analogy, so many more building blocks. You know, when we as builders talk about architecture, we'll often talk about, you know, architecting for availability. We architect for performance, for security, for function. Uh, you know, we spend a great deal of time doing this. But I say, Simon and the listeners here, there is a new domain for architecture, and that is the economy. Um, so when you're building a system, you need to look at the economy of your architecture because you have a great deal of control over it. Simon alluded, you know, in the intro just earlier, you know, potentially getting that bill shock of being in cloud, right? So what I mean by economy of architecture is how can we achieve the same or better outcome for a lower cost? And I'll actually show you how you can do this. So we want to talk and move away from, I guess, this model of heavy upfront design or, you know, some finger in the air predictions of what capacities we'll need in the cloud. You know, we did this on-prem. It used, you know, five virtual machines in our hypervisor. So we'll just map that directly into Azure. Again, we want the same or better outcome for a lower cost. And I would say, you know, embrace the idea of radical change during an application's life cycle, you know, funded by cost savings. Now, there are degrees that you can do this depending on whether you've built a system for yourself or you may be using COTS, like commercial off-the-shelf software. I'll be showing you options that you can apply to your existing stacks um, or, you know, what is possible. Again, you know, driven by the economics. Show me the money, I say, right? So, again, this star system. So, in this session, I'll show you the money. But as a bit of a teaser, here are some of the percentage savings you'll be able to make. So I'm not here to tell you about, you know, the one or two percenters. These are sizable chunks that you can remove from your bill. So we have the, uh, you know, do not pass go, do not collect $200 here, okay? I'm talking about the obvious stuff here. I'm only going to spend five minutes talking over the basics before we dive deeper and get into the nuts and bolts of this session. So I'm talking about fundamentals in cloud here. Who knows what their per transaction cost is for their application? Do you know, right? Um, do you know what the cost per hour to operate the systems that you're responsible for? Who tracks in real time and then sticks it up on a board or in the corner on a screen? And I guess lastly, you know, who has no idea what their actual cost is from a business centric perspective? The thing is, right, you can't improve what you can't measure, full stop. Here's probably my first piece of wisdom here. You need to calculate your you know, per transaction costs. From a beginner level, you know, simply do it by hand. Sit down with, you know, the Azure cost analysis tool, figure out your transaction rates, do some rough calculations and either be pleasantly surprised or really shocked depending on what comes back to you. You know, intermediate, um, you gather these transaction volumes in real time from your systems, but you still calculate it by hand based on, you know, tags, resource groups, billing data on a periodic basis. But, you know, moving up that chain of maturity here, monitor it in real time. Um, plug those transaction rates into something like event hubs. And so you can dive into it real time. You know, what is my uh, average transaction flow versus my infrastructure cost? Put it in the corner and then say, hey, dev team, optimize this. This becomes your measure. And look, I've worked in organizations before where we've had uh, a pseudo taxi meter and you can see the cost of cloud, you know, ticking by. So I want to talk about operational optimization. And this is an interesting one because a lot of people really don't think about this. Okay. So move off a pay as you go to an enterprise model. So we're talking enterprise agreement. Um, it offers built-in savings ranging from, you know, 15 to 45% based on a committed spend. And these, you know, commitments typically work. The more you buy, the better you discount. So rather than having your subscriptions everywhere, moving into an enterprise agreement is effectively amplifying your, your buying power. Do you have an RI target for utilization? If you don't and you are running IaaS inside Azure, you should. Um, some of the best organizations in the past I've seen have had up to 80% of their IaaS resources deployed on a reserved instance. Rule of thumb is to assess a workload for three months 
during that time, you know, right size your instances, look at services like Azure Monitor, and we'll get to that later. Uh, ensure you're not paying more than you need to. Look at the CPU utilization or whatever dimension is relevant for your application. Tune your application. Now, Azure offers two different scopes for RIs. So you can specify a subscription scope, meaning Azure will apply RIs to the VM within the designated subscription. So you can move an RI to a different subscription if needed, but there's also the shared scope. So Azure will then apply the RI that you purchase to any subscription within your enterprise agreement. Another reason why you should go down the AI path. Invest in RIs for stable workloads. Now, operational optimization. It's an interesting one because people don't really think about it. You And you don't really think about it because you, ha you have people, you hire people in your organization, they do stuff, you pay them, they come in. But the stuff that they do, you know, their day-to-day, -day, what does that stuff actually cost? So I thought I'd do a little bit of an international investigation. So what does it cost for a DBA per hour? Now it's been all converted into US dollars around the world. And as you can see, uh, life in Brazil and Japan is pretty good, but I'm guessing the cost of living there is also pretty high. Now this is just the median DBA. And I guess none of us here are working with you know median DBAs, right? We've got experts who we work with. But let's think about all these things, you know, our DBAs do. Um, everything has a cost. You know, what is the actual meaning of all this cost? What are we doing here? One of the tasks that DBAs do, you know, they'll often do, you know, a minor DB version update. What is the cost of that? So if you're going to be doing one of these yourself, you know, it is a considerable amount of work. So if you're lucky, you know, we've just spent eight hours doing something that has realistically no perceivable business value. Leveraging a service like, say, Azure MySQL, fully managed, you could do this in one hour, right? We still know we want to apply the update. We're going to run it in staging and then we'll run it in production. We'll still go through the process of creating a notification record. Um, but I can also track in great granularity what has happened. I can watch it either in real time or, you know, look at the logs afterwards and attach it to a change record for auditability. You know, fantastic here. So we've gone from eight hours to one hour for the same, I guess, non-business differentiating task. I'm being a little bit lazier and I've made my life a lot easier, but I've also saved my organization a truckload of money depending on where I live. At the infrastructure side, lots of levers to pull here. And a real easy one I think is storage. Now, one of the biggest chunks of spend in the cloud other than compute is storage. And I wanna give you a way to save money on your storage without any code changes at all. This, um, I guess, is really interesting and it takes advantage of storage tiers particularly. You know, do you understand storage in Azure? So I thought I would work through here a real example. I'm storing hundreds of terabytes of photos because you know that's what my app does. And each photo is about 10 megabytes inside. It costs me today around 200, sorry, $2,007 using hot storage inside Azure. But our data has a long tail. So what I mean by long tail is most data after 30 days, say 80%, doesn't get accessed. And if it is needed, it's seldom, right? It's not often. And when maybe because you know people are getting bored with the pictures, their cat pictures in this app. But let's say 20% maybe gets returned once a month. You know, there, there could be a few exceptions. By creating a policy, you know, which is a few clicks, no code changes, I can put a tiering policy in place to my storage account. I'm able to save a whopping 36% on storage costs with my new, you know, monthly cost being $1,308. You know, not bad for a few minutes effort. All right, so right sizing your VM. Um, you know, again, I'm, I spoke about the blog before. How often are you taking a look at the instance families within inside Azure? You know, do you see from time to time, you know, an update? a uh, new instance family has arrived. You need to regularly, again, you know, coming back to, you know, building that, that hygiene into your environment, revisit your instance family choices at least every six months because there are, can be significant cost savings between Azure VMs depending on your workload. Now, again, let's use an example and walk through here. So look, every six months, maybe every quarter, keep an eye on the updates 
to ensure that you are running on the latest uh, instances. And if you see one of those in the update blog come through, it's probably a good cue for you. You can also look at Azure Advisor for some hints. But in this example here, we're looking at a Windows VM, something pretty common, you know, a D4, so four CPU, 16 gigs of RAM instance. So by, by comparing the two generations here, so we've got generation three to generation five, so we've skipped one, um, the latter is 14% faster, but 7% cheaper. So maybe I need less virtual machines to deliver the same business outcome. And in many cases, it's just a matter of powering machine off and starting again on a new instance type or changing your ARM template to reference a new instance type. Segwaying out of choosing the right instance types, if you aren't using Azure Advisor, take a look at it. So the TLDR for Advisor is, you know, it is a personalized consultant, a cloud consultant, we could say, that is ingesting all the telemetry and being able to help advise you on the cost effectiveness, performance, reliability, and security of your resources. Who here uses spot instances? I love them, and I think they almost need a round of applause by themselves. The short of it is, right, we have capacity in our facilities that gets unused. You know, it sits there, it's dormant. We capacity plan so you don't need to. But it means we have a lot of capacity that at times is sitting idle. Capitalize on this idle capacity. They provide great value for your workloads, but for many people, they're only familiar using these in maybe dev, test, or some highly scalable, embarrassingly parallel processing type of work. Workloads that are ephemeral, you know, that can deal with virtual machines going offline. But did you know you can use Spot in you know more applicable ways? Could it be part of your steady state workloads, you know, for your virtual machine scale sets? I certainly think it can be. And I challenge you to think that you can leverage Spot from, you know, for these styles of workloads. So if we look at the example on the screen here, we've gone from 40 cents per hour for a D4 V5 to 4.4 cents, you know, is the juice worth the squeeze, right? Is the effort in kind of, you know, rigging up a little bit of like Azure functions to keep an eye on things, uh, you know, worth it? And I would say, you know, for up to 90% cheaper, absolutely. I will also say, keep an eye on for Spot. We are constantly making changes, making it even easier to integrate Spot more and more into our platform. So let's move away into some of the meaty stuff here, right? We're talking architectural optimization. And if you're an architect or a developer joining us today, I think you're unbelievably lucky because with every day you are getting new levers to pull. Eliminate your web services tier. It's a pretty bold move, right? Um, and I'm sure everyone on the call here today has a web tier in their application. But do you really need one? You know, what is it really doing? These days with modern web frameworks, you know, JavaScript based ones, could you actually eliminate your web services tier? I think unless you're doing a truckload of like mod rewrites or, or other stuff, you're really just spending most of your time, you know, again, patching, feeding, upgrading, looking after these, just like our DB example earlier. You know, one of the approaches a lot of customers are using today is to start using Azure static web apps. Now I'm gonna say, it's kind of a bad name, personal opinion, because it's not that static. It's 2022. The world runs on JavaScript, ECMAScript, base frameworks, and you can do a lot of things. You can make API calls. You can invoke an Azure SDK. You can call Azure APIM. Static web apps support JavaScript, TypeScript, um, including those developed, you know, those popular frameworks such as Vue.js, React, Angular, and so on. So spars or single page apps are fast becoming the norm in cloud-based development. Now, if we take, you know, an average page size, and these days, you know, an average page has over 150 objects or more, probably on the low side here, and the average payload is around two megabytes. Let's just say we've got 100,000 page views per day. We're getting 450 million gets per month. That's roughly, you know, six terabytes of data transfer. You know, I'm paying $1,538.43 using modest virtual machines to host this. I'm not even calculating the fact here what it costs to administer, which I didn't calculate. So I'm no longer patching web servers anymore. I'm no longer spending time doing capacity planning. 
I'm not having to worry about my security scanning because the pipeline is so much easier to scan. Static web apps are awesome. And I would challenge everyone today, have a good hard look and consider the possibilities. You know, do you truly need those IIS, Apache, Engine X based machines lying around? All right, on the database side here. Now we talk about SQL or NoSQL and in application design, all roads lead to Rome, as they say, right? But in the application world, Rome is often that relational database. NoSQL databases and the use of caching is awesome. It's an awesome way, not only to bring speed, but to drive out cost. And if you look at any large scale software development company that is delivering a web scale application, they've got caching everywhere. It's just normal and we need to take advantage of this. Let's not confuse our OLTP versus OLAP databases here, right? So there's a reason why we have like a reporting style, you know, service versus a relational database. But for the same reason, you need to separate the two out. There's often going to be hotspots in your database. And these are giveaways, you know, hopefully that aha moment. Um, the bit I need to migrate to something more suitable for that particular workload. Now, I'm not saying, um, you know, relational databases perform terrible. You know, let's move everything over to Cosmos. But what I'm trying to say is here, you know, pick and choose the most appropriate and not only for performance, but from a dollar value perspective, caching the right, right parts of your application, you know, putting it in an in-memory cache such as Redis or a NoSQL database can be a game changer. I want to talk to you about my time at an organization that had around 20,000 concurrent users Every uh, you know Monday morning, it would drop to probably about you know fifteen thousand throughout the rest of the week. But you know it was a C sharp application storing session state in a relational database. Now the performance and cost benefits to the business were plain to see in moving to an in memory cache. Now I'll look a quick poll here. You know, drop it in the comments. Who uses an in memory cache today? Love to hear. So even if you have hot content on your website. And you think it's, you know, it's incredibly dynamic, cache it for three seconds, even one second if you're really super busy. What a great way to relieve pressure and hotspots on your application. You know, you may not need to scale as much up or you might not be able to go as wide. So in-memory caches, you know, uh, if you had a look at Stack Overflow's state of developer for 2021, Redis is incredibly popular here, right? So in-memory caches are great tools in your toolbox. Okay, so architectures, they can evolve here. And this is the fun part of the session, it's demo time. So let's make this real. Let's talk about an app called Toilet Finder. Now the Australian government provides quite a few public data sets, data.gov.au. What I'm looking at here is the public toilet data set for Australia. So we've effectively created a lookup table with 18 and a half thousand records. And, uh, you know, we've massaged this a little bit using GPS coordinates to come up with postcodes. And ultimately, I've created an app that, given a postcode, you can, you know, get a list of the facilities in that area. So we'll switch and take a look at the code here. Really kind of basic stuff here. So, you know, it's really not that much code at all. We're using Botul for, uh, you know, it's a bottle app and we've got a default route, displays hello world. If not, we are looking at you know, taking input in the form of a postcode, you pass it a postcode. It connects to an Azure MySQL database to which we perform a select statement. We return some results and we display them in a JSON format on the screen. I'll illustrate this in a moment, but we're going to just walk through the architecture here. So what I'm trying to illustrate in this demonstration here is we're going to pivot from running on virtual machines, which is, you know, it's familiar. It's what everyone is, you know, is familiar with today. They're quite reliable. We're going to pivot from virtual machines. So I'm using in this scenario here uh, to burstable 2MS you know, pretty low cost virtual machine, costs $154 a month. We're going to pivot over. We're going to containerize it. So, you know, it's effectively, it's 
almost free here, right? We're going to use Azure Container Instances. So we're no longer needing to manage, um, uh, you, we're, no, we're no longer having to manage the underlying compute layer. We're throwing our virtual machines, our containers, I should say, at Azure Container Instances, and it's you know dealing with everything. We no longer need to manage and patch our servers. Again, though, it is the same business you know, outcome. And then finally, we're using native Azure functions. We're going to functionize it. We are not having to manage any servers. And I will say the best server to manage is no server. And in the scenario here, I've put it to actually free, right? So yes, there are um, you know costs obviously involved, but the first 1 million executions or 400,000 gigabyte seconds of Azure functions each month is free. So look, based on the usage of in this scenario here, it is actually free, but your cost, you know, your mileage will vary. So we're going to jump into a little bit of a demonstration here and I'll walk you through how I've gone about this. Okay, so I've dropped into Visual Studio Code here, you know, really basic app. I'm importing my SQL uh, bottle. We've got a default route, as I mentioned, it's giving forward slash hello world. We've got a route of forward slash postcode to which I pass in postcode. We validate if it, you know, if it's more than four digits. We connect to our MySQL database server. We run a select statement. We get some records back. We convert it to JSON. And we're pretty much done. In this scenario, because we're using Bottle, we're running on port 8080. We also, from the containerized perspective, we've just got a Docker file here, right? So we're using the base image, Python 3.8. Our Docker file where, you know, copying things around, we're installing requirements. We're using pip3 to install bottle, MySQL connector. And again, we're exposing on port 8080. So we're now in the Azure portal. As you can see here, we are looking at Azure MySQL. We've got our server name, toilet-mysql.mysql.database.azure. We're at MySQL 5.7. We've got a real basic SKU here. We're now looking at our virtual machine. It's running Ubuntu 20.04. Again, you know, standard B1, and it's got a public IP. Now, I thought about SSHing in here, but if you're not aware, take a look at the Azure Cloud Shell. It allows you to natively SSH in within the Azure console. Really handy. You can use Bash or PowerShell. So I'm connecting via SSH. I'm changing directory to where my application is in the scenario here. And I'm going to execute it using the Python 3 interpreter. So we're listening, so 0.0.0, .0 means any IP, and we're running on port 8080. So we're grabbing a public IP, it's in our clipboard, we're inside our browser, we're going to port 80, 80 and we're getting hello world, because that's our default route. We don't have a route for ABC123, so it's caused an error. So we'll pop in postcode 3000. I'm in Melbourne, and these are the public toilets in Melbourne. And we can see also just down bottom there, you know, the, the verbose logs in bar bottle. So I'm now taking a look at Azure Container Instances. Sorry, I should say Container Registries. Because with containers, you need to push your container into a registry. got our repository, we've got our toilet app. And we can see our manifest file. So now we'll go back to container instances. We've got the public IP address, we've got one container running. Now, you may be thinking, hey, that took a little bit of time. So just remember, with the containers, you will have that first start, uh, you know, cold start penalty hit. But think about your production workloads. It's typically not a, not an 
not an issue in productionized environments due to the constant load. So cold starts, whilst you know they do exist, they are real. Realistically, the performance impacts in production are effectively you know void. Um, you don't see these performance implications on in production. Hence, I'm going to pop another postcode in here. You can see how rather snappy this is, right? 2458 doesn't exist. No, I don't know where that is in Australia, but let's just try another one in here. So, you know, you are initially paying, I guess, that, you know, a little bit of a uh, cold start first hit penalty. So that was containerizing. So we're now back again in the Azure console. So I've gone into function apps. I've created an Azure function. And if you're not familiar with Azure functions, you, they're so simple to create. Again, you know, the best server is no server to manage here. You can see my code. Now I've removed, because this is Azure Functions, there's no need um, to have the bottle web server running here. So, you know, very simple, native Python. The whole premise is, you know, run my code on behalf of me. We've got a URL endpoint. But what uh, you, you may have noticed in there, I'm no longer, you know, hard coding. Um, I'm not, no longer putting a static connection string is here. So we're using this dynamically and we're going to grab this from the application configuration of the function. So in the top right hand side, we've got a fully qualified domain name. And again, you know, I popped in a postcode, we're getting the same results. So effectively what I've illustrated here is the fact that we have the ability to deliver the same business outcome in three different ways with three very different cost profiles. How good is that? So if you are thinking about, you know, containerizing or using Azure functions, I would highly encourage you. And for everyone on the call here, you know, if I was building a Greenfield app, I would start from functions. If I can't use a function and go to containers, only then would I contemplate using a, you know, a virtual machine because they're expensive. All right. So pivoting away from that, as we, you know, close out this session, I want to talk to you about my number one. Do not do this anti-pattern in the cloud today. Now, I'm sure we've all seen plenty of good and bad things, but if you're doing this today, I urge you to stop. And that is using a database as a blob store. You know, databases, particularly relational ones, make horrible blob stores. It's, it's convenient because it's what people know, um, but it is a negative in terms of performance, management, and cost. So I've got an example here of we're storing images the common thing or PDFs in a relational database, MySQL and scenario here. Each image is two megabytes in size. We have 3 million rows. Our rows now become 2,049 kilobytes per row using an Azure MySQL single server. It's going to cost us $3,820. But if I was to store, you know, use Azure storage and then have a pointer, you know, from the relational database into Azure storage, I'm saving cost and I'm increasing performance. You know, Now, a bit of a thought provoker to end the session today. Availability zones to reduce cost. How interesting. So consider, you know, we have a, we've got a region and inside a region we have availability zones. So these availability zones, they're isolated by power. They run separate floodplains, et cetera. You know, geographically close enough for synchronous comms, but far enough uh, away from each other, typically, you know, the 40, 50 kilometers that if something goes bad, you know, completely isolated. They are a bastion, a cornerstone foundation building block for high availability. Now in this example here, we need to maintain 12 instances even if one availability zone is disrupted. Actually, I think I've got a typo here. We need to maintain six, six instances, even if one availability zone is disrupted. So, you know, by using two availability zones, you put six in each, right? I lose an availability zone. But if you use three availability zones, you can maintain those 
six instances, even if one availability zone is disrupted. How cool is that, right? So we're using one third less infrastructure just by spreading it out over three availability zones. So if you haven't thought of availability zones as an economical mitigation point, take a look at it. So as we close this session, the cloud, you know, Azure, it is a rainbow of opportunity for you. Are you looking for the pots of gold in terms of economy? Because they are there. Azure provides you a raft of new levers, you know, that can help you deliver the same or better business outcome for a lower cost. Architectures should evolve during the lifetime of a system. And this should be driven um, via the economics. You know, what is a cost to change? There's going to be a cost, right? You know, a dev effort. Um, changes in services can be, you know, consumed uh, over time. And Azure is providing you, you know, these additional new levers. So um, I've left my contact details here. I would say, look, thank you, Simon, for having me on New Breakpoint. And look, if you do want to connect, drop us a message on LinkedIn or Twitter. All right, Shane, great topic. Obviously, something you're very passionate about and you've had a lot of experience helping people go on that optimization journey uh, when it comes to building and using the cloud. Um, we could go anywhere with this this kind of topic, um, but I'm going to ask you the what's top of mind. You obviously talked about AZs there. You talked about doing things like don't put blobs in databases. What's in the Azure space? What's the the one sort of optimization opportunity for optimization that you're seeing at the moment that you think everybody should be paying attention to? Okay, so firstly, exactly, Simon. There is so many things to talk about now. I think in terms of thematic changes for the industry is the coming of, of ARM. You know, we've seen Apple recently, you know, transition what they call into Apple Silicon away from the x86 architecture. Azure now has Ampere-based instances, ARCH64 architecture, delivering up to 50% cost savings for the same levels of compute slash performance as an x86 offering. So, you know, as that gets rolled out within Azure, these are almost quick wins if you have a software stack and particularly it's mainly open source at this stage because the humble raspberry pi has done a lot of the heavy lifting <laughs> you know to quickly just you know pivot over to an ar64 yep. architecture and start you know saving real dollars well and and also the positive story here is also to start contributing towards uh, saving the environment as well that um, you know compute to to power ratio goes down quite substantially when you shift to a an arm architecture look Fantastic topic, Shane. Um, we are going to have a live Q&A in a few moments that Shane's going to hang around for. So if you are still watching along, please do uh, stick around for that. Um, I've put uh, the link to today's show notes up on the screen there. So that's the, the episode debug log, plus also a link out to um, all of our videos for all of the new Breakpoint episodes. As you saw, Shane had uh, his details earlier in the slides, but we'll make sure those go into the show notes as well. Shane, thanks a lot for hopping on the show today and I'll see you in a few moments for the Q&A. Thanks, Simon, and thank you all for attending.